Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this book launch. Before we start, may I please ask that everybody just keep your microphone switched off during the presentation and the interviews. And um, if you would like to ask any questions, there is a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen in which you can type your questions and the questions will either be answered um, as you type them or um, we will ask Johan to answer the questions at the end after the interview is done. I do wish to remind you that we only have 60 minutes for this, um, for this session. So um, we have very strict uh, time limits. There will be, as I say, then an opportunity for all the questions that have been um, asked in the Q&A section. And we will also, if there is still time, also allow uh, for live questions to be asked. With no further ado, I wish to introduce you to the author of the book, Empowering Novice Academics for Student Success, Wearing Different Hats. I had the privilege to work with Dr. Johan Hichu for almost 14 years at a private higher education institution here in Belleville in the Western Cape. Johan has been in education for almost four decades. And during this time, he has demonstrated his passion for young adults and the contribution that they can make to the economy of our country. The Council on Higher Education emphasizes the importance of student support and higher education institutions must be able to provide proof of the measures that it has in place to ensure quality support for its students and to ensure that they complete their studies successfully. Student support are divided into three pillars, namely student success, now that refers mostly to what we have in place to assist the student to complete their qualification successfully. The second pillar student support basically refers to academic support that is given to the students and student wellness refers to the health and wellness of the students. Several challenges can prevent these successes for students and Johannes always ensured that students who were fortunate to be in his classes received the best possible education and support. He has a passion for students who have challenges with learning and is always willing to go that extra mile, even supporting students after hours at no additional remuneration. This is a perfect demonstration of passion for your industry. And I always say that education is not just another job. Education is a passion and we have to do our education with passion. Therefore, it did not come as a surprise to me that Johan would embark on writing this very valuable book. Many times lecturers in higher education institutions do not hold a formal teaching qualification. And that could lead to only the transfer of knowledge and skills to the students sitting in their classes and not focusing on the invaluable graduate attributes that employers are looking for. This book aims to close that void for the novice lecturer from being the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. It provides the novice lecturer in higher education uh, a broader spectrum of teaching and to look out for the signs of barriers of, to learning and how to address it. Johannes illustrated these barriers and solutions with practical examples from his own experiences throughout his career. We also have another presenter tonight and that is Lorraine. Lorraine will give us an overview of um, the book that Johan has written. And then directly after this um, overview, your, Lorraine will um, then also do a discussion or an interview with Johan um, about the book so that we can 
uh, get more information regarding this. Lorraine is a lecturer at Stellenbosch University um, in the Department of Nursing and Midwifery. She is responsible for teaching and coordinating postgraduate diplomas in nursing education. This makes her also a very passionate educator within the field of nursing and she holds an advanced diploma in nursing education. I would now like to hand over to you Lorraine, who will also do the interview then with Johan directly after um, we, you have given us an overview of the book. Over to you. Thank you very much Veda. Um, thank you for the introduction and it is a privilege to be here today. As a lecturer who is involved in teaching novice academics, I really am privileged to form part of this book launch. I've known Dr. Ihu for some years, and I really appreciate his significant contribution to teaching hundreds of novice nurse academics in the postgraduate diploma in nursing education at the Department of Nursing and Midwifery at Stellenbosch University. Today we are privileged to teach in a time where there is such a shift away from the traditional teaching paradigm that did not always consider student diversity. We understand that teaching and learning should be student focused and therefore it cannot follow historic teacher focused approaches. So I was really excited to read about all these different hats that was discussed in Dr. Hiku's book. In the nursing education program that I coordinate and in which Dr. Ihu taught so many classes, we really experienced that novice academics are already content experts. So they have already formed many opinions about teaching and learning, perhaps based on historical teaching practices and their experiences as students. So for them, it might be especially difficult to wear these different hats and um, that's so important for student success. I agree with the preface in Dr. Hugh's book and I quote, teaching is becoming increasingly challenging for reasons such as the dynamics of teaching and learning processes and the wide range of roles that teachers are expected to fulfill. So perhaps these words became even more relevant as students and lecturers were challenged to constantly move teaching and learning strategies between online teaching and contact teaching during the pandemic in the last year and a half. So as a result, the academic landscape of today was forced to change and adapt very fast. However, it is not only the pandemic related challenges that we need to consider. We should understand the unique South African context in which we teach. And we need to consider the diversity of students, but also the diversity of academic staff and the institutions in which they teach and learn. So the book Empowering Novice Academics seeks to answer the following didactic questions. Firstly, why do I teach? Then, how does teaching relate to learning? The third question is, how can I provide instruction to ensure desired learning? How can I measure if learning has indeed occurred? So these four questions um, in this book is really aimed at novice academics. However, I'm sure that most academics had to, like myself, re-examine our own teaching practices, but also how students learn and how we assess the effectivity of teaching and learning. So if we look at what student success then really is, and, I, and this quote is from Education Technologies website, and it states that students, for students, success consists not just of good grades and steady progress towards graduation, but a holistic sense of fulfillment. They want to become strong candidates for careers in their chosen fields. They want to emerge as competent and trustworthy adults and look back on their time without regrets and make their mentors and family members proud. When viewed in this way, it is no small task to empower novice academics for student success. This book then really considers various contributors to student success, ranging from academic literacy, the use of technology, understanding values and beliefs and the foundations of teaching, learning and assessment. 
I would like to quote from the book summary on page 410. As part of the diversity challenges, learning barriers are causing some students to underperform and may even result in them dropping out. This is not the inevitable results or only option when considering the best way of countering academic underachievement. Putting in something extra for the sake of better student success is a challenge that all higher education teachings must respond to. So um, when looking at these aspects in the book, it is really um, something that stood out to me is that this book is different, different to many other textbooks that I have used in um, teaching novice academics. So I would like to ask Dr. Hiku to elaborate on um, some of these aspects, and especially Dr. Hiku, what did you find different in this book? And to elaborate on how it can assist comprehensive or holistic approaches to teaching and learning. Um, Lorraine, I think firstly, for those of you that don't know me, um, my first qualification was visual communication design. So I do have a very strong creative mind and I've managed over the years to apply that creativity. Um, that having been said is that I always to do something if possible differently so some of the features of doing it differently uh, I would say at least four or five features um, firstly um, I'm a strong advocate for a holistic approach. Um, I think as Vida has mentioned, um, and I think Lorraine, you support that, is that the traditional role of only passing on information is only one expectation of higher education teachers or educators. There are some models that say um, there are at least 12 to 15 roles they have to fulfill. So that is one example where I'm arguing is that uh, one of the areas that academics need to be empowered or novice academics is having the ability to perform all those different roles. Then um, another one is that I also fortunately have a practical orientation to things. Uh, yes, uh, I'm academic, but my approach in this book was to cover both theory, because it's for novices, but on the other hand, to demonstrate by way of examples, amongst others, how the theory can be applied. Um, quite often, you get textbooks that primarily or predominantly cover theory. Then. I always end up asking the question, what now? So I have taken a step further by sharing my experience. Having said that also is that, and I wasn't fully aware of that, is that we've along the way with Sun Media decided to present the content both by way of a textbook, either the traditional printed one, or in online format, accompanied by a workbook. And the workbook, amongst others, covers reflection questions, responses to those questions. Um, to take it a step further, to assist and guide the readers to think about the practices. Then two other things is that I have decided to present generic content that can be applied in any discipline, whether you at a TVET college or a university or a private higher education uh, institution, the fundamentals remain the same. But how you apply it will determine by your context. 
So therefore I have covered both parts. And therefore the, the, the workbook, uh, which can be used in CBT uh, training workshops um, in a way is unique. And then maybe two other things is that um, with my graphic background, I have made extensive use of diagrams, all my own diagrams. It's not copy diagrams to illustrate uh, abstract concepts, because what I've learned about learning is that a lot of students, if they come across or they encounter new abstract knowledge, some of them find it difficult to grasp it. And therefore, if you illustrate a page or three by way of a diagram, almost like a summary, it makes the abstract concept, concepts more digestible. You will, amongst others, write the very first page of the first book is an advanced organizer, a graphic advanced organizer, which simply means it's, a, it's on a one page, a diagram that summarizes the entire content and that also orientates you about what is coming up. And then finally, perhaps, I have tried to write not in a traditional academic way, factually, but almost in a narrative style. Because I'm also wearing different hats. I'm wearing the hat of a lecturer and academic, of a researcher, but I'm also wearing the hat of an instructional designer. I'm also wearing the hat of um, being creative. And Therefore, I think in terms of how the readers would find the content also digestible. And therefore, I have, without avoiding uh, the scientific terms, but I've followed the approach of using a narrative approach, almost sharing my experience, telling my story or stories which also makes the reading a bit more user-friendly. Well, thank you, Dr. Hu. You um, have said a lot of um, things in, in this bit, and perhaps we can unpack some of that uh, a little bit. And to start off, do you think that this, um, by, by being a single author of this book, do you think it, it um, changed the tone of the book or the style of the book? I think that's usually one of the first questions um, when you plan to write a book, whether it will be a single authorship or whether you will act as an editor, inviting inputs from different academics. And I, I took some time to look at the, those options from different sides uh, because they are strengths and weaknesses in single authorship, but also strengths and weaknesses in having multiple authors or contributors. I've ultimately decided to, as I've said, to tell my story. So right from the start, I took the stance. Um, this is not the final answer. It is closing a knowledge gap but there's enough generic content that can be applied across many different disciplines. And one of the main reasons for following this is approach. For example, with my creative inclination and writing in a particular format, it will make it easier for me to follow the same pattern or approach right through from the start until the end. And you might lose that when you have different authors. 
because uh, I mean, if you've got different authors, the editor counts simply change the entire content or the tone of the content. So yes, there, there are benefits to it. There are also um, certainly maybe certain aspects that I haven't covered or haven't covered uh, sufficiently, uh, but maybe we can address that in a later publication. Yes, um, I, I think I would like on um, to, to discuss that a little bit more, the tone of the book and, and the style that, that is used in a book, which is quite unique. And I would just like to quote one sentence from page um, 115 um, as an example. And the quote is teaching of high quality, if not, is not something you think about at the breakfast table or while driving to work. So the book seems on a much more conversational tone, um, perhaps than what one finds in many other textbooks. And if you would like to elaborate on that, because you've already said that you wanted to take a different approach in this textbook. Um. I, I, I've shared it with many people, even with students. Um, I did my master's at UNISA. And after that, I did a tertiary education diploma at UNISA. But also, during that time, I got hold of all the study guides, as it was called during those times. Nowadays, people prefer study letters uh, and all the materials because I very soon realized during my studies, my postgraduate studies, that if you want to be an effective teacher or educator, you also fulfill a communication role. So I always put myself in the shoes of the student because so many things can go wrong between what I share with students. Either it's incorrectly pitched or you fail to understand that when you, for one period, teach honor students, the very next period you teach second year students, then you must step down in the way you com communicate with them, the examples you use, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, even in this book, I try to put myself in the shoes of the readers. Uh, as I've said, not to become non-academic, but to make the content digestible. In other words, uh, apart from stating the theory of the facts or the concepts, also give frequent examples, uh, including reminders with graphic icons inserted in the text, which is the model, modern uh, style of writing textbooks. Like in a side paragraph, you've got reminders and say on this page, this is what I call the take home message. And that's also then inserted uh, examples, research results um, from different fields, primarily from the health sciences. And the reason for that is I wanted to create um, like what we say in research, you need to ensure that the red line is running through right from the start of the text until the end. So I've decided to focus on one particular discipline and take all the examples, the practical examples within that field. So I chose the field of uh, medical and health sciences, so that those readers can also see, okay, how all the different aspects covered in the book are being implied within that particular field. But that does not mean, as I say again, it only applies to medical and health sciences. So that may be in a way is also different. Mm -hmm. I agree. There seems to also be a lot of emphasis on the correlation between theory and practice. So, um, and there's a lot of reflection activities, especially in the workbook. So, um, 
Would you want to elaborate on, on that um, approach to um, combine theory and practice in a textbook? Um, and th I think uh, Lorraine, both you and Vida and probably most of the um, listeners now or participants are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. Um, one of the things I've realized when I started using Bloom's taxonomy in, for example, uh, instructional design, uh, assessment planning and design is that, and I've addressed that in the book because there's a whole chapter on, on assessment practices is when I started moderating assessments, I came across too many examples where even on an honors level that some assessors or lecturers or teachers, they only assess the lowest level of bloom in terms of remembering. Ignoring the NQF level or the difficulty level of this particular module. So, and I've in, included a diagram and my past students will remember that, is that when you move up the NQF levels, if you move to an NQL level eight, an honors or a master's program, certainly your, your, your outcomes are different. Your pitching is different because it's postgraduate level now. Then obviously your teaching must also develop critical thinking skills, which you can't necessarily do on a first year level. So my argument is that, and I've even therefore tried in this book, particular workbook to include at the end of every chapter, I've included reflection questions to assist the readers to start thinking about the practical implications. Some of the sources uh, that write about reflection say, when you're a teacher, you, you need frequent reflection to become a ref reflective teacher or a reflective practitioner. Thinking about what has happened in the past? For example, in terms of student success, how many failures did, did I have in my module? And I've done it. Then saying, what do I do now? Do I still carry on after 10 years in the same way? But I'm not achieving something better. Uh, what are the areas that I need to improve on? And what will I do on, uh, regarding that? So those are guide, basic guiding questions in terms of reflection. And therefore, I think uh, through my postgraduate studies, very soon, fortunately, I've become a reflective practitioner. And I always, even with second year students, even with third year students, I'm not only talking about postgraduate students, I, I started on a very low level and simple level, even in assignments, putting in questions, helping them and guiding them and even forcing them to think about this module. For example, how will apply, I apply this in real life? So this is a bit of my philosophy about the importance of uh, reflection. Thank you, Dr. Hu. This is a, a really a, quite a unique way of, of um, writing and presenting this book. And another unique part is the inclusion on, of a section on academic literacy in the textbook, which um, I think is, a, is quite a unique feature. Would you like to tell us about what made you um, decide to include a section on academic writing and academic literacy? Ah, uh, th those of you that are familiar with the current trends regarding education in South Africa generally, um, 
some authors and writers go, go as far as saying that education in South Africa as a whole is in a crisis. When we look at student success from the higher education perspective, time and again, researchers write about gaps in learners, 12th grade learners, making the transition to post-school education. And the term underpreparedness is being used frequently in the literature. Part of that underpreparedness is, for example, problem solving ability, application of knowledge. It's not only about passing an exam and getting the National Senior Certificate. So there's also, and I've, uh, I'm currently addressed this in a follow up textbook, that we need to close that gap. And I strongly believe, and that's why in this particular book, I've included that chapter and I've, I've, I've given examples and I've highlighted certain areas where teachers and academics can play a role in addressing those knowledge and skills gaps, whether it's about academic or scientific writing. I mean, when I was still teaching academic literacy, I came across students, even master students, that don't know the difference between structuring content, having a log logical frame of reference and a sequence of thoughts. They think if you, if you plot down 20 facts in assignment, then you will get 20 marks. There's no reasoning, there's no argumentation. So I've also highlighted simple things like aspects of grammar, vocabulary. I had students who, because English is their second and third language, they struggle with teaching in English. They, they haven't got enough of vocabulary in this specific dis discipline but also in English to express themselves. And now it affects the assessment of the student. Therefore, you, you, you come across a dilemma, should we now penalize them because of their inadequate use of English or only on the basis of their knowledge? And who's been confronted with that? You and me. So that's why I've given Perspectives on that as one area that, that we need to address also in uh, program design. I know the Council on Higher Education, they very strongly feel about um, what they call academic literacies in foundational courses or module at first year level. Because when, when students and I'm not saying all students, but those students who are identified that they have ability gaps to achieve success. Deficiencies in terms of academic literacy might let them fail a particular course or module. And we need to close those gaps. So that was the reason behind including that. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we sure do have a very diverse student population and also a very diverse academic um, staffing component. So when, when I listen to all this, um, Dr. Hu, and taking into consideration the current landscape of um, academics and how we were launched into changing um, our courses to, to um, really um, use online teaching and learning and online assessments and various platforms. How do you think that this book can assist novice academics to teach and um, assess on these various platforms, which now recently became more and more important as time goes on? Away from the traditional lecture method that, that 
um, we we used to embrace more often. Yeah, I I haven't included a single chapter on online learning, or if you want to call it distance learning, but there's a chapter on the core uh, enabling environment, which is about the teaching learning situation. And there I've included a significant number of pages on the role of technology with some examples of online learning possibilities, but also highlighting barriers. And I've even myself experienced barriers from students who come from a disadvantaged background. The whole, the whole issue, uh, what, what you probably know, what we call the digital divide. Some students who can't actually use online learning because they don't have the hardware, they haven't got enough money um, for increasing the required memory, et cetera, et cetera. So there's how they, they can't afford the data. But I've also, in the chapter on instructional design, I've also addressed um, the issue of, well, what I call technology-mediated learning. And then also in uh, the chapter on assessment practices, I've also included perspectives on uh, online assessment. Um, not many details, but I decided to integrate it as part of the bigger picture. Thank you very much. Um, it really is a comprehensive way at looking at all these challenges that novice academics um, face in our in our current situation. But before I hand back to Vida for some more questions and answers that people may have, Dr. Tiho, in a nutshell, what would you say to empower novice academics? And then also, what more can we expect from the pen of Dr. Yuani Um I think firstly, It might come as a surprise uh, when we talk about online learning, um, digital learning, technology mediated education, whatever term you want to use, is that, and, and people are free to differ from me. I almost want to summarize it as. Teachers still do matter. Irrespective of what technology offers us, irrespective of a lot of changes, we cannot take the teacher out of the teaching learning situation. Because at the end of the day, it's you and me who analyze the situation, we need to plan for instruction and learning. We need to implement it. We need to reflect on it. We need to design assessments. We need to make improvements or changes when necessary. We cannot expect technology to do it. Therefore, there is a saying, technology per se cannot teach. It's human beings who make the technology work. And then secondly, um, I'm currently working on a follow-up, which will hopefully be available at the beginning of next year on the same topic of student success, but now from different perspectives. 
was I've covered now the perspective from the academics and the teachers. But as you know, there are student support services. There are a lot of strategic decisions that need to make, uh, amongst others about the resources, about access, about student selection, about student placement. So in the follow-up uh, textbook, which I call, it's a back-to-back -back approach. So this one sets the basics. So the second one is gonna build on this one. So I would, person would advise um, even seasoned academics, at least for their department or their institution, get both, both books. Because for the novices, they need this one. But I've also experienced that even some seasoned academics or teachers or lecturers need to be reminded about the principles of assessment. So maybe it would be a good thing to have both resources on their desk. Thank you very much, Dr. Ho. I agree. We can all go back to the basics and we can all reevaluate our teaching and assessment and learning practices that we implement every day. So um, we are looking forward to your next book. And um, perhaps I'm sure they will tell us where we can get this book, but I'm going to hand over to Vida now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine and Dr. Hugo, for um, Lorraine, especially for you, uh, giving the overview of this valuable book, as well as the interview or the discussion with Johan regarding the contents of this book. Um, we will now take a few questions. Um, there are two questions in the Q&A, which I will quickly read out to you, Johan, and then you can just respond to that. And if there's, if there's anybody else who would like to ask a question, you are welcome to raise your hand as well. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you will see a little hand there, which you can uh, just raise and we will give you an opportunity. So Johan, the first, um, it's more an opinion than what it is a question. Christian Jacobs said that this is not a question, but my opinion. Bloom's taxonomy is so outdated, we will never be able to empower our students to become creative and innovative on the higher cognitive domains with these old school learning theories. We need more robust approaches to learning theories pushed by the fourth industrial revolution and decolonization of the curriculum in an African content. Do you wish to um, reply on that? Um, yeah. Um, I agree in a certain way. Uh, firstly, regarding Bloom. Um, I've been in academic staff development for several decades. And I'm the first person to say there's much more than Bloom. In fact, I personally use the modified version of that. That includes creativity. As you know, some, some of the models uh, puts creativity right at the bottom, uh, at the top, um, when you work with uh, other lecturers in the arts and uh, design fields, they say before you can evaluate or critically analyze, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, you need to create a product. So I fully agree that we need a more robust approach, um, which is maybe a challenge for other authors to contribute. Um, the reason why I am still using a modified um, Bloom's uh, taxonomy is that with my engagement with novice lecturers, this is a fairly simple model that they can manage. Certainly, if we deal with seasoned academics, then I would, the first person would say, 
we need to look at uh, more complex models, more challenging models, or even more appropriate models. Then in terms of the second um, opinion, in terms of, for example, curriculum transformation, yes, I definitely support that. In fact, I was part of teams um, working uh, on curriculum transformation, uh, even at a course or a module level. But as you know, when you deal with curriculum transformation, certainly you need to look at different options of curriculum design, amongst others your philosophy. Um, and I have published in the past a lot of articles about, call it the Africanization of learning content. Not the content itself, that's something different, but the way the lecture is presenting it. Ian Scott, for example, have argued that one of the areas that is lacking in research is, for example, uh, how do we address the diversity of our student population? Diversity in terms of language, in terms of culture, in terms of values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and again, I'm the first person to say uh, the time is past where we can address all students in the same way. Uh, there needs to be more customization, more contextualization, more differentiation. Thank you, Johan. Um, I have another question also from Christian Jacobs. Um, did you consult with students to provide them a voice uh, to give their experiences of the so-called new academics classroom practices? Generation Z has a completely different view of the teaching and learning situation as we as baby boomers and Generation Z. Yeah. I, I very strongly support that. Um, in the last section of the book, which I call Special Challenges, I took a particular stance regarding, again, as I explained, uh, managing or addressing diversity um, challenges. I won't call it problems. And as you know, diversity cuts across many things. Um, age levels, uh, language levels, culture levels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in the follow-up textbook, uh, I'm addressing that in much more final detail. Um, and the reason for that is that this particular book is for novices. And along the way, I had to decide how far will I go? Because my experience with uh, even staff development with novice academics is that the moment you go too far, too fast, you lose them. But in principle, I fully agree that is an area we should address and that will be addressed in the um, second book. Thank you, Johan. Um, then Johan Stuop has um, raised his hand. Johan, you're welcome to pose your question. Johan Stuop. Can you hear me now, Vida? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I find the um, presentation very uh, comprehensive in terms of what Dr. Johan Bicho says. I just have a interesting question here. I'm a lecturer in the Middle East and I'm doing a PhD on in comparative studies between two universities, one university in South Africa and the other one somewhere in the Middle East. And I'm talking about professional learning of lecturers uh, of, again, you know, in a comparative study in both these universities, one year, which I'm here for five and a half years, 
and um, one in South Africa. Now, I I went through Dr. Johannes Ichu's um, text um, and textbook, and um, I made some couple of key notes. And I, I would love to, with his permission, use some of the interesting contributory comments that he delivered in the book. So my question here is that um, professional learning, um, in my literature readings and reviews, I, I do have to highlight this in my study, uh, but obviously we talk in South African terminology about professional development, the old PDP plans, et cetera. Um, how does this is there a strong re resemblance in this? And how would a professional learning, how does Dr. Johan Hichu, how does he, how does he, how does he classify or interpret professional learning? Uh, as he talk um, very often in his book of teaching learning spaces, which I really appreciate, nice phrase to use. So professional learning for me is an important aspect for my study. And uh, how does he, how can he help me to understand this concept of professional learning better in terms of his paradigm, if that makes sense? <laughs> yeah, Johan, um, I would suggest that you contact me afterwards. Yeah. And maybe we can set up a, a, a separate a Zoom or Teams or Skype, uh, even several uh, meetings. Uh, to discuss the finer details, mm -hmm. but uh, generally, um, one of the publications based on um, research, a research paper by, uh, um, written by uh, Ian Scott from UCT and colleagues on behalf of the Council on Higher Education about uh, teaching and learning changes and innovations um, in South Africa. And right at the end, um, he advocated for professionalizing uh, teaching and learning in higher education, amongst others, by way of professional development courses, uh, workshops, with an institutional capacity building approach, and Vida said that right in the beginning, uh, one of the limitations of higher education is it's not like at schools where academic staff must have a professional teaching qualification to be able to teach at higher education training level. So I know of many people who have done a postgraduate diploma in that field. I've, I've done it myself, but it's not compulsory. So he and his colleagues argued for extending that, strengthening that, to professionalize the teaching or what some authors call the pedagogic um, practices. Um, this is what the stance was. And I took that by saying, okay, my argument, and that was my basic motivation behind this publication, is that I want to make a contribution from the perspective of professional development, from the perspective of instructional design, from the perspective of the teaching learning space. In other words, the space where the lecturer or the teacher or the educator engages with students, even the online space, to improve the quality of that teaching, which ultimately, we hope, will likely to improve the quality of learning, which hopefully will improve the achievement and the performance of the students. And right at the end, hopefully also increases or would increase, at least for some students and some institutions, the throughput rate. 
I don't know whether you're on whether that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, as I, that's a great uh, comprehensive answer. Thanks, Dr. Johan. Um, I, I think, um, you know, from my lived experiences here and, and I taught um, in South Africa as well, um, but for about five, six years and then the five and a half years here. So I, I don't think I would classify myself as a novice academic, but um, I, I think I'm a more into almost, I don't know how you see it. The, the lived experience I had was very intense here in the Middle East. And we're not talking about Dubai or the softer, the softer Middle East countries. We're talking about a country like Saudi Arabia, uh, where the um, learning and teaching or lecturing and teaching then is a dynamic yet positive challenge, not for all lecturers here, but for me, because you want to be progressive, you want to be effective and all those fancy words. Um, so I think, Dr. Ihu, your, your answer is good. Um, my, my focus, as I was reading through your script and or to your textbook, um, is from a professional learning of lecturer's point of view. So I would love to, maybe if you, if you would uh, write more books or if like short journals, but we can talk after via email to one another. But thank you for that answer. I appreciate that. Yeah, Johan, I can perhaps just uh, in terms of um, also you come across the term scholarship. Yeah, I saw teaching that. Teaching and learning in, uh, in higher education, teaching learning. Yeah. So, so there's a connection. Mm. And I refer again back to Ian Scott who said that we need, can I give you an example? when a lot of institutions, for example, I had a number of students in, in different disciplines, but doing a PhD or a master's within the faculty of education, but in adult education, not school education, which is different. And there's no reason why we can't do research and, and, and over the past decade, there was a sharp increase in research about teaching and learning in particular disciplines at higher education level. That's scholarship. So, so the, the, the whole issue of professionalizing higher education, teaching and learning and scholarship, continuous scholarship, continuous reflection, to me, is very close to my heart. Dr. Hugo, yeah. um, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt there. We, we only have one minute left, and there's such a lot of things that I think are questions that we can still ask you and um, tap from your, your experience and uh, everything that you know within this 40 years that you've been in education. But I would just like to um, then end off by saying that I did put Dr. Hichu's uh, email address in the chat box. It is yoga at tiskali.co.za if you wish to ask um, him any further questions regarding the book. Johan, thank you so much. Um, Lorraine, thank you very much for doing the interview. And it was such an insightful presentation I think we all learned something tonight and Johan we wish you well with with um, this book and we are eagerly awaiting more publications from your pen um, or should I rather say from your computer keyboard thank <laughs> you so much thank you so much and thank you that we can learn from you and I always say you are never too old to learn so thank yeah. you for very much. Yeah, thank I'm. You. Thank you, thank you, everybody, for your participation, your questions. Um, I'm a typical academic and researcher. I am still learning, uh, despite my many years of experience. Um, but as we said in the beginning, this is my story, uh, certainly, 
there might be different opinions and so forth. Um, but it's also to stimulate you to do your own publications or let, let's work together. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, everybody, for attending. You must have a lovely evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.